Please welcome to the stage, Cameron. Big round of applause. Thank you. Hey. Thanks. Thanks, man. Good afternoon. I know it's the end of the day, so who wants to listen to an old fart coming and telling you about uh, God, iTechpreneurship or anything like that? But uh, I actually have a suggestion for you. We are going to have a little bit of comedy hour. So those of you who want to have a bit of sense of humor, raise your hand. Oh, everybody. So let's actually show your support for Cameron's Comedy Hour a little bit stronger. We go one, two, three, and say, yes. Ready? One, two, three, yes. I didn't hear you. One more time. One, two, three, yes. A little bit better. So what are we going to talk about? First of all, you might say, how am I even able to talk about chaos? My name in Persian is Kamran. In English is Cameron. In Japanese is Kamiran. Kami is God. Ron is chaos. So I am the creator, the god of chaos. Any of you have any problems, any issues? I'm the cause of it. Now, how did I get here? And what sorts of things have I done that would allow me to go and do the biggest, craziest project that I am about to tell you? First of all, I was born in Iran, in Tehran. In those days, to get the most advanced education, I had to come to America. So I did. I had all my schoolings in the United States. In Iran, I was a horrible student. I had graduated with C plus as my GPA. I came to America. I asked everybody, do I need to sit in your classroom? Do I need to listen? to some boring professor. The ones who were confident, they said, no, you don't have to come. So I didn't go to many of the classes. So I was 20 years old. I had two bachelor degrees. What did I learn from that experience was it was not about teaching. It was about learning. When I was 21, I had my master's degree in computer graphics. When I was 24, I started to work at Hewlett Packard, HP, Corporate Engineering Labs. Now, previous session was talking about from zero to hero. Let me mention to you a little bit of how my life as an entrepreneur started. I went to work at HP, this huge corporation. Within six months, I decided that I don't want to be just an engineer. I want to be a manager. So I went to my boss, and I said, hey, how can I become a manager? My boss said, you have to wait many years. He said he had to work wait five to six years before he could become a manager. I said, this does not make sense. I went and I talked to his boss. And he said he had to wait even longer. And to become second level manager, he had to move up, but wait a lot longer. So I figured out by the time we get to president of HP, Everybody should be 200 years old. How could this be possible? What can be a disruptive method to change this? I went to corporate headquarters. I was in corporate engineering labs, got the corporate brochure, looked at everyone, and I noticed 
everybody was looking like they were 100 years old. There was one face who was senior vice president who looked like he was around 42, 43, 44. I said, he knows the answer, how to go from zero to hero, how to become a disruptor within an established system. His name was Doc Chance. So I picked up the phone and I called him. His assistant disrupted my call and said, who is this? I said, I'm Kamran Elahian. And she said, what do you need? I said, I want to have a meeting with Mr. Doc Chance. She said, does he know you? I said, no. She said, what is this about? I said, it's personal. She said, we'll get back to you. I said, OK. So I waited a few days. Nobody called me. So I called them again. Same story. I waited a few days. I called him again and again. And again, every three, four days, I would call. We would have exactly the same conversation and no result. The system says a young, new engineer cannot talk to the big, big, big boss. So as I was looking at the corporate brochure, it said HP believes in open door policy. I said, ah, here is an answer. I called him up, same thing. I said, this is Cameron Elahian. I want to have a meeting with him. She said, I will get back to you. I said, no, you don't need to get back to me. Just tell Mr. Doug Chance that he does not practice open door policy, and I believe it is a bullshit slogan. Two minutes later, my phone is ringing. I answer the phone, hello, this is Doc Chance. How can I help you? I said, I want to have a meeting with you. He said, what about? I said, it's personal. So he agreed to see me. I went there a week later, and I told him the story. I want to know what is your reason that you're so young and you're senior vice president of this big corporation. He said, can you imagine what he said? He said, the reason you're sitting in here tells me you already know the answer. I don't need to tell you the secret. You already know the secret. And I thought about myself, hmm, maybe creating disruption is not such a bad idea. I said, well, would you agree to mentor me and help me move up? He said, sure, every now and then, give me a call, I will meet with you. So I let a few months pass, but in the meanwhile, strange things happened. They approved me to go and take management training courses. And even though I was only 24, I was getting some special consideration. So I started to look around different parts of HP. And I found out we had about 20,000 or more software engineers, hardware engineers, system engineers, only 50 chip engineers. So I thought, why? Why are there so few chip engineers? Then I did a little bit of study, and I found out in the whole world, there were less than 1,000 chip engineers. This was 1979. So I went and I talked to one of my professors at Stanford, Jim Clark. He later on became CEO, uh, founder of uh, Silicon Graphics, later on chairman of Netscape. He said there are two professors at Stanford who can teach any software engineer to become chip engineer. 
do you want to take the course? I said, sure, but I don't have money. Stanford is very expensive, and I'm working full time. He said, well, if you find a way, let me know. So I went, talked to my bosses, and I said, imagine if we had a thousand chip engineers. We could do things that nobody else can do. They all said, yeah, how can we do that? I said, there is this professor's new style. They are teaching how to become a chip engineer. And I want to take the course. They all agreed. They paid my tuition. They agreed I work part time. And because this was such a great idea, they gave me another promotion. So I went to Stanford. I studied chip design for one year. The chip was fabricated, came back. Does anybody want to guess, did it work? Those of you who think the chip worked, raise your hand. God, you all have heard this story, or how is it? You have no faith in me? <laughs> Unfortunately, the chip didn't work. You are all right. I probably look like a bozo, and you figured it out. So imagine. The chip is fabricated, so many people are waiting for the results, it comes and it doesn't work. Major chaos, major problem. What do you do? I went and I told my boss, I have good news and I have bad news. He said, what's the bad news? I said, bad news is the chip is not working. He says, oh no. You are going to be fired. I might get fired. This is major disaster. I said, no, no, no. There is a good news. He said, what's the good news? I said, the reason the chip was not working is the method Stanford used had no simulation, no analysis. We just designed the chip based on theory. No experiential learning. We are HP. We know how to make engineering workstations. All you have to do is give me five engineers, half a million dollar budget, and within a couple years, I will design a new engineering workstation for HP, and we can enter a multi-billion dollar business. He said no. I'm tired of your bullshit. Every time you come, you give me a promise. I'm not going to do it again. I said, if you don't do it, I'm going to take the engineers, best ones, and we are going to leave and start our own company, do this our own way. He said, you are the youngest engineer in here. Nobody will follow you. Leave. So I went and I talked to some of the best engineers. They all agreed this is a good idea. I said, let's leave. They followed me. Three years later, HP wanted to buy the company for $50 million. We decided we should ask for more. We contacted HP's primary competitor, which was Tektronix Corporation. We had dinner together. They asked me, how much do you want so there would be no negotiation? Normal brain says maybe 55 million, maybe 60 million, because that's Good enough thing. HP doesn't like to negotiate either. But if you are looking for disruption, I added 50%. I said 75 million. Next morning, they gave us offer for $75 million. And I said, I'm so stupid, I should have asked for a billion dollars. <laughs> this was 1984. Imagine, I wasn't even 30 years old. 
After that, I started nine more companies. Not all of them were great. Three of them failed. I was fired twice. How many of you have been fired before? One brave person admits it. Oh, second brave person. Third one. Can I ask you to stand up, introduce yourself, and tell us how you failed and how you fired? Which one? See? Give everybody your name. I'm Elizabeth, and I've been in different tech companies around Europe, and I've been um, fired for not playing internal politics. I've been fired for mm, not making the numbers. Um, it's always been a great step forward. See? One of my heroes already. Thank you, Elizabeth. We had somebody else over there who raised their hand. I guess it was gentleman with the glasses, right? My name is Mark. I'm the CEO of Healthkey, and I was I was fired for a company and hired for the same company one week later, uh, just because there were differences on the way I was running the projects. See. It's okay to be fired. Why is it okay? Because it says you try to do something different. And when you try to do something different, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. The trick is not to be afraid of failure. It's easy for everybody to be afraid. The trick is to overcome your fear and take a chance to do something different. So I told you, all together I started 10 companies, three of them failed, and I was fired twice. That's the bad news. What was the good news? Six of them, had very successful results. Of the six, three of them were acquired. Three of them were IPOs. They were all unicorn IPOs, multi-billion dollar. Between the three of them, they generated $8 billion in shareholder equity. So while it hurts, it's difficult to fail and do something that is risky. If you are not afraid and are willing to go and create chaos a little bit in your life, maybe even in your family, because some of your friends, maybe your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend would be angry with you. Why do you leave a big company to go and start a new one? If you don't do it, you will never forgive yourself. If you do it and it is a big success, then everybody calls you hero. But if you do it and you don't succeed, I call you a hero. Why? Because that is the path towards becoming a real hero. Each time you fail, you learn something new. And you move up. I wanted to learn to a ski. When I was 50 years old, I went and hired a ski instructor to teach me skiing. I told him I want to be an Olympian. He said, Olympian champion. I said, yeah. He says, you mean for old people? I said, no. I want to compete with the young people. And he said, are you crazy? 
I said, why are you complaining? I'm giving you, I don't want to be champion tomorrow. I want to be a champion by the time I'm 100 years old. I'm giving you 50 years advance notice to work with me. What kind of a coach are you? If you have 50 years, you cannot make me a great skier. Grudgingly, he accepted. So I started the path. It was difficult. I fell down. I fell down. I fell down. Each time, I got a little bit of injury here, a little bit of injury there. Some of them were big injuries. You know, when you like sports as much as I do, and when you overcome your fear, like I've learned to do, many times, it would be fantastic if you have talent. If you are like me and you don't have much talent, that is recipe for disaster. Every sport that I learn, I am happy to tell you that I had many, many failures. Today, I ski black diamonds. I'm a master scuba diver. I'm also a master horseman. I'm a pretty good tennis player, and I do a little bit of race car driving. But do you know how I got there? Not because I had talent, because I failed and I did not give up. Can anybody guess how many surgeries I have had in my life? I fell down, I broke this, I broke that. Any guesses? Somebody. 24. 24. No, not that many. But we are getting close. Any other guesses? 10. Okay, somewhere between 10 and 24. 15. Almost 14 surgeries from top of my head to the toes I have had. And some of them have been real serious, really difficult. But each one of them, when I was failing, I looked at it as a gift. How could somebody be so stupid to look at failure as a gift? Think about it. I will tell you, one of my worst accidents was when I wasn't ready, I went on a double black diamond ski run and I fell down and I destroyed my right shoulder. The doctor said I may not ever be able to raise my hand again or serve or play tennis. I had to go through significant physical therapy. So how could that be a gift when it is so painful? Can anybody see any positive thing on that? When I broke my shoulder, I couldn't do anything. It's in a sling. I went to my tennis coach. I said, I want you to teach me to play tennis with my left hand. He said, you are really stupid. What if you fall down and break your left hand? Then you will have no hand. I said, no. Teach me. He reluctantly agreed, so I started to play with left hand. There was positive, there was negative. Negative was I had no power. All my life I have been using my right hand. I had a lot of muscles, a lot of power here. Left hand, not much power. So guess what? That's bad news. The good news is this hand had zero experience. No bad habits. Think about it. No bad habits. 
When I learned to play tennis on my own with no instructor, because I was poor, I didn't have money to pay an instructor, I developed many bad habits. I would hit the ball, it would go everywhere, couldn't control it. And when I took lesson, I would listen to the coach for a few minutes, then I would go back and hit it the stupid way. But with the left hand, I had no bad habits. And I listened to him. And when I listened, I started to learn how you hold the grip differently. What is the continental grip? What's the western grip? What's the eastern grip? How do you do forehand topspin, underspin, backhand topspin? All these things I never learned with the right hand. I had to learn the technique because this one had no bad habits. You can say it was a virgin hand, no experience. What happened was I learned to play a little bit better. And then, guess what? Within six months, when my right hand shoulder was fixed, the knowledge somehow transferred from left hand to right hand. I started to play with my friends, many of them that I used to lose to them because they were much better, I could beat them. And they were all surprised. They asked me, how is that possible? What is your secret? I said, if I want to tell you my secret, I have to break your shoulder. <laughs> so that was a gift. But that's not the end of it. I noticed that because I had become ambidextrous, I could use left hand and right hand, my brain had expanded. And I started to do things with both hands. I noticed I could write English from left to right and right to left. Have you ever tried to write English or Spanish or Italian this way? It's very easy. Uh, I, we don't have a blackboard here to show you. Or Persian. Usually, you write it from right to left, I can go the other way around. And I notice, huh, how is this happening? You know, Leonardo da Vinci had a method for coding his messages. He would write his messages in Italian instead of left to right, right to left. When you look at it, it looks like garbage. If you put it in front of the mirror, you can see, oh, it's a nice message. But my brain, through this process, had learned to read things forward and backward, backward and forward, do things differently. So I started to say, what an amazing gift I got. Now, what I told you about all of my entrepreneurial things was the first 25 years of my life. The next 20 years, the next 15, 16 years, I became a venture capitalist. Had a global venture capital fund, $350 million, and we invested in high-tech companies starting from 1999 in United States, Japan, China, India, Israel, and Singapore. And through this process, we learned how different countries have different style of entrepreneurship, different ecosystem for innovation, and how they can pull themselves up from poverty to quite a big, amazing success. You look at China. You look at India. Both of them are miracles. In 20, 30 years, 
they brought each one of them, three, four, five hundred million people from pure poverty up. Why were they able to do that? This is the power of iTechpreneurship. What is iTechpreneurship? It's high-tech entrepreneurship leveraged by broadband. That little i means broadband. Why is it so important? Why is it we can do things today that nobody could do before? When I started my first company, it was called CAE Systems in 1980. We didn't have that little i. We didn't have internet. I had to buy all the computers, all the servers, pay for all of the software licenses up front. So to get my first MVP, minimum viable product, I had to raise $1.8 million. Imagine, it's 1980. Those of you might remember, the revolution in Iran happened in 1979. You are living in the United States in 1980. Every day on the news, they are showing hostage crisis. And you decide to leave a nice company like HP to go and start your own company just to go from your crazy idea to build the first prototype, you have to raise $1.8 million. Imagine you go and tell investors, I want to raise this much money. They say, can we see what it can do? I say, no, it's just an idea. Give me the money, it takes us a year and a half, we develop something, we can show you what we are doing. And they would say, you sound crazy. Where are you from? I say, Iran. What is their second question? Why did you take our people hostage? I say, I didn't take anybody hostage. I'm a kid. They say, well, we see every night. Some of the other investors would say, you're only 26. You're coming from Iran. Immigrants are good for engineering. You want to be the CEO? I say, yeah. They say, but CEO should be somebody tall, handsome, very charismatic. You're short, bald, chubby. This doesn't fit the requirement of a CEO. In the 80s, we didn't have young people become CEOs. We didn't have immigrants to be CEOs. We didn't have women to become CEOs. With that little eye, the world has changed. Today, anybody can go from idea to an MVP with less than $100,000 in Silicon Valley and less than $50,000 in many other countries. Why? Because you have the cloud. You have new business models, pay as you go. You have freeware, you have shareware, all sorts of things that were not available before. And there is another thing. The highest way to generate value is not to do mechanical, electromechanical, microelectronics. It is use software and algorithmic content, computational thinking. The whole world is moving towards that. Newest thing you see is the highest value transportation company is Uber in the United States, Didi in Japan, sorry, in China. 
What does Uber do? What does DD do? What does Grab Taxi do? What does Karim do? All of these companies use computational algorithms, computational thinking, algorithmic content to figure out who needs a ride and who is available to give them a ride and select using algorithms the closest person considering the distance, the traffic, to connect the two of them together. There is no mechanical engineering, there is no electromechanical, no chips. It's all software and algorithmic content. Uber's value right now is higher than General Motors plus Ford plus Chrysler. Crazy. But that's how the world is going in everything we do. You look at healthcare, you look at insurance, you look at construction, you look at everything. We are going towards software and algorithmic content. That has the highest value. If you want to see, do a Google search on 10 highest value companies in 2008 versus the 10 highest value companies in 2018. You will see in 10 years, the whole world has changed. In 2008, the name of companies were gas, oil companies, a lot of uh, consumer uh, companies. The new ones are all Apple and Google and Amazon and Didi and Tencent. All these software and algorithmic content companies. So the world is changing, and that's good. Why? Because all you need to do to generate value is to have a good brain and have access to broadband. You don't need any natural resources, and you don't need the approval of incumbents. Usually, big corporations, big governments are all monopolies, dictatorships, running everything by old men. The new innovation economy is not understood by old men. It is understood, it's created by young boys and young girls. Because all you need to do is have a brain and have access to broadband. And in evolution of our species, we never had this situation before. So not only men and women are equal, actually women have certain advantages. Because when I was growing up, all I had to do was be a good boy and get good grades, which I failed in both of them. My sister, who was three years older than me, she had to be a good girl. She had to go and be successful at school. She had to also help my mom feed me, feed my brother, take care of us. She had to help her with shopping and with cooking. So from young age, she learned how to develop patterns, algorithms. Do I do this job first, or this one, or this one? Boys usually do not learn that, because all we have to do is be good at sport, be good at schools, and that's it. So innovation economy has amazing chance to go and create a lot of change, a lot of chaos, but it's going to save us by creating a lot of new leaders to take us to a brighter future. Thank you all and love you all. Appreciate that.